Let's make a real lazy troubleshooting video because I can't be bothered my good cameras going in for service. So uh, this is the power uh, over the amplifier module out of a KEF PSW2 facing subwoofer. Uh, I wasn't actually going to repair this thing because I just wanted to so, copy some schematics out of it. But uh, uh, I found a very good schematic service manual for it and uh, I figured we might as well give it a try at fixing it since uh, well we've got such a good schematic for this thing. So the uh, uh, symptom this thing has right now is uh, it makes a horrible grunting noise when you uh, power it on. I've already uh, done a slight bit of repair to it since I replaced an op amp and a capacitor which were uh, had suffered a conductive glue. There was a live stream the other day. Uh, but uh, that cloud hasn't resolved all the issues with this thing, so that's the speaker going in. Well, we've got power, so let's turn this thing on and see what it does. So we click that. Draw some power. I can hear it growling away. So, something is oscillating, and it is oscillating rather bad. Uh, it does a pass-through signal now, once I've replaced uh, these components, this op amp and this capacitor, uh, but uh, it doesn't sound very good at all. Uh, so, uh, th th this uh, device obviously comes in two pretty separate pieces. We've got the uh, power supply, power amplifier PCB there, and the preamp uh, and power on PCB here, and they seem to be rather self-running, they don't have much uh, going on between them, save for power coming out of this board and signal going into this one. So the first thing I want to do is uh, make sure, uh, or rather, which board is uh, causing the noise. We could have oscillation even the power amplifier or the pre-amplifier. I am strongly suspecting the pre-amplifier since the power amplifier uh, isn't on fire. Uh, so... Uh, to troubleshoot that, I've got the scope, and uh, I'm just going to probe uh, the output signal uh, coming from this board. If we've got uh, an, a signal uh, of, of some sort coming out of this board with nothing going in, then we've got an issue here. And uh, then I'm just going to disconnect the boards and make sure that uh, the oscillation issue is still there with the two boards separate. Uh, because if it is still is, you know, then we can just entirely focus on the preamp board because the power amplifier is most likely just going to be absolutely fine. Alright, we're now probing C and 6 on the power amplifier board here, which is the input from the preamp. Well, there, there's some magic going on there, but I think that's the input. So let's have a look at the scope and see what we'll get there. So, power on. And uh, that is a rather high frequency oscillation. So, there's definitely something funky going on with the uh, preamplifier or the power amplifier. But uh, at this stage, I'm leaning towards the preamp since uh, we've got this on the input of the uh, power amp. So what I'm going to do now is uh, disconnect this wire and see if the oscillation remains on either end. If it doesn't then we've got to really troubleshoot both devices but uh, I'm going to place a bet and say that it's probably going to stay on the preamp end. Oh, I get, I've now disconnected the input lead from the pre-amplifier board just because that's easier to access and I've hooked my scope in instead. So we're just about ready to fire this thing up and see if the oscillation remains with the power amplifier in place. However, when, when you're doing something like this, uh, you need to consider that uh, the device you're working on might uh, not be built to work at all without the a pre-amplifier connected and uh, the only reason I dare disconnect this uh, lead is because uh, uh, I've checked the schematic here or I would have re reverse engineered it uh, because this is the input connector to the power amplifier and uh, the we've got a ground coming on pin 2 there and a signal going on pin 1 and uh, you can see that pin 1 goes through a resistor through a resistor, through a thermistor, and then to ground. So even if we remove the signal source from here, we still d are not leaving the input of this op amp floating in mid-air. And because if the if R one forty seven wasn't here, 
Because if R147 wasn't here, uh, then uh, uh, this the negative input and this op-amp would just be floating with uh, nothing to actually give it a signal, and which means that we'd possibly have a giant voltage swing on the 8-bit of a pay amplifier which could cause it to uh, oscillate on its own and perhaps even blow up. So you need to keep that in mind. So let's turn on the power and see uh, if it is still oscillates. And it is still oscillating. So we definitely have an issue on the preamplifier side. Excellent. That's what I wanted to see. All right. So we've now narrowed down that we've got issue. We've got an oscillation going into the power amplifier, uh, coming out of the preamp somewhere. So what we want to do now is just try and further narrow down from where that might be coming. And uh, if we start with a schematic for this thing, uh, we've got a lovely way of cheating a bit here, because. This entire piece, chunk of the stuff here, uh, is the apparently the low-pass filter, and it has no feedback path. As you can see, we've got our inputs to the left, and nothing except for a 10k resistor coupling that to an output. Uh, this uh, connector here, CN4, goes to the input of all the other stuff on the side. So, if we measure. Uh, what's at uh, one of the, the signal pin of CN4, uh, we will see whether or not uh, there's any crap coming out of this part, which we need to consider. If CN4 is clean, uh, then we can be certain that uh, our oscillation is occurring somewhere within this stuff. And this is CN4 right here, this brown lead going from there to there. And it's sharing a ground uh, with the connector I desoldered, so I'm just going to probe between that ground I've already soldered in and uh, one of the pins of CN4. Here we go, probing CN4, turning the amplifier on. And we'll get a bit of a pop. But uh, this is entirely clean. So, we can rule out pretty much the entire low pass filter assembly as a cause of issue. Sweet. And just a bit of an aside, we can actually confirm that the power amplifier is actually working by poking around the input connector. So I've got some music coming in this RCA lead. And while that sounds absolutely terrible with no filtration, it, uh, it's working just fine. We've got no noise, it's coming through clean enough for me. So that is one working power amplifier confirmed. Another sign I'm going by to troubleshoot this is the temperature because we've got one off amp which is running rather tasty. It's been well over 40 C in the past and it's reached over 60 after it's been on for a while. So some of the oscillations definitely got its central right around there somewhere. U8. Alright, I think I'm starting to make some progress because I've been probing around U8, which is the hot running op amp which has a lot of oscillation around it, and I checked the schematic to see what the non what one of the channels was used for because this has uh, two channels. Uh, one is used for audio, one is used for the auto power on the feature. And if we look that up in the schematic, so this is the uh, auto power on circuit, and as you can see, it is incredibly simple. We've just got signal coming through a cap, going into the op amp, which is getting high pass filtered and uh, limited by diode, and then going out to some power on uh, circuit. So there is nothing there which would actually be able to cause severe oscillations. And that made me think, because I'd also been messing around with the bodge capacitor which was on the board, because if we look where I've currently got the little brain electrolytic, this guy, uh, this originally had a capacitor from the factory, little tiny 0.22 microfarad thing, and that's going from the 8-bit of this op-amp to ground. So I figured, okay, I'll see if that makes a difference as it increased the size of the, the capacitor and it slowed the oscillation down. And that made me question the health of the rest of the circuit, uh, which made me abide by the first rule of troubleshooting, they shall measure voltages. 
And while the power supply for the op amp does measure quite fine, it's a perfectly good plus minus 15 volts. If we take the scope and probe the negative rail and then just turn it on, we will see well, there's a bit more to this 15, negative 15 volt rail than meets the eye because let's turn it on. And this is what we've got. So we have one volt, one volt per division here. We've got a huge amount of ripple on the negative 15 volt rail. And I figured, okay, that's perhaps not such a big thing because the op-amp is running hot. We have got something oscillating there which could be causing everything to draw a lot of current. But that, in turn, uh, made me suspicious enough of the power supply to install the green cap there. So the green cap is installed between the positive and the negative rails of the uh, op-amp. It is not uh, solid in as of now. And uh, that, that's just for demonstration purposes, because that actually fixes the issue. And uh, that just makes me go, hmm, there's probably some issue in the voltage reg for this thing. So, without soldering the new cap in there, let's probe this with the horrible uh, proprietary ESI meter, which I can't give you these uh, files for, uh, and uh, see what the capacitors for the plus minus 15 volt rail are. So uh, to measure these caps I'm just going to probe here on the plus minus negative input, the plus, plus minus 15 volt input of the board. So the middle wire of this uh, three pin connector goes to uh, the ground of the uh, power amplifier slash uh, power regulator board. Uh, this one goes to the positive rail and this one goes to the negative rail, rail or the other way around, it doesn't matter. But let's just probe between uh, two of them. Let's do those guys and see what we get on the meter. Now that is 3 ohms 75 microfarads, which is not very good for a capacitor this size. Uh, we would really want to see a rather low ESR. So that hinted an issue. And then I measured the other pin. So we're now measuring from the middle pin to the other side. And that is a bad cap because we're seeing an ESR of 36 ohms and a capacitance of 50 microfarads, whereas we would expect at least as good a result as we got from the other rail. So, with that in mind, I am going to make a bet that the issue in this amplifier is one of these two capacitors because these are the plus minus 15 volt regulators and these are the filter caps for them. So if we take the PA board 8, replace these two guys, I think this thing is going to sing like new. And oh dear, with a board 8, it's becoming rather obvious why this might be a failure point. 220 microfarad 16 volt caps used to filter a 15 volt power supply. That is no good at all. We should be at least 25 volts rated. And they certainly measured nowhere near 220 microfarads. Oh dear, and if we have a look on the other side of a PCB, it's not getting any nicer. This thing's run incredibly hot and someone's obviously had a go at trying to fix it because these resistors are in series with the uh, plus minus 15 volt regs and they've run so hot as to severely discolour the board. That's not looking good at all. They must have broken the solder joints quite severely and uh, caused issues which uh, made this thing be scrap to begin with. Jeez, I probably want to clean that up a bit more because that doesn't look very nice to begin with. Yeah. Well, this has turned into a bit of a bigger rescue operation than I had intended because the area around the power resistors uh, powering the plus minus 15 volt regs was entirely ruined 
uh, because it's uh, received burns from a bad solder joints. So there's been a lot of sparking and arcing going on. That's what the uh, old repair was for. Uh, but as you can see, uh, th this was all untouched. I've had to grind away just incredible amounts of burnt PCB material, which was uh, conducting all over. Uh, now, I'm not sure it actually caused any issues, save for some heat generation. The PCB was obviously running a bit warm. Uh, but, uh, yeah, this is cleaned up now. All the conductive... Uh, uh, carbonized PCB material on the board has been removed so I'm gonna reinstall the components and uh, uh, wire everything up with a few jumpers uh, the board it really is not doing well it's rather common having to actually grind away board like this when you have like bad solder joints in relatively high current applications because you just get a huge uh, amount of sparking arcing going on of the PCB material cannot handle that at all and to clean this up I usually just use a Dremel with either a brush head or a tiny cut uh, cutting or grinding disc just to get in there and remove conductive material but yeah getting all the stuff back in I'll clean these up slightly I think these caps are going to be good enough I don't care and I'll uh, just uh, reinstall everything and I think this thing is going to work just fine all right there we have the PCB kind of put back together I've just jumped everything with wires to recreate the broken tracks so all that's left to do is uh, put all the components back, the well the big caps and screw everything together fresh paste on the power transistors and I think this thing ought to be good to go. Oh yeah, once I actually replace the broken caps as well. Alright, so the uh, uh, caps are out, the suspected failure points, so let's verify that they actually are our problem. So we are rated 220 microfarad 16 volts, so we would expect a result similar to what we have in the new ones, which is probably around 100 milliohms, and yeah, about 220 microfarads. So that's what we're looking for. Let's see if these live up to that. 47 microfarads and 55 ohms of internal resistance. So this one's an absolute goner. It's a 47 mic capacitor in series with a 55 ohm resistor. And the other one. 11 microfarads and over 100 ohms of internal resistance. Yeah, this one is absolutely toast. And that is what happens when you filter a 15 volt rail with 16 volt caps. No good. Alright, it's back together and uh, we should be ready for a test run. So, I uh, haven't glued everything down yet, but everything's back in place. I have gone to the effort of replacing most of the small electrolytic caps, so for these guys because I didn't have any fitting replacements in stock. Now I've uh, re re restored this circuit to its original shape. We've got a new 0.22 microfarad cap going between ground there and the output of one of the op amps in the auto turn on circuit. So, now that should really be uh, as this thing left the factory pretty much. I tested the big caps, they measure fine. And as long as I didn't screw anything up with the wiring of a broken piece of B down there, we really should have a working subwoofer on our hands, I think. So, uh, everything should be ready for a test run. Let's see what happens. So, w w whenever I do uh, like uh, one of these first turn on to re after a repair, th th that's one thing I listen for, and that's the sound of an overstrain transformer. Because if I've shorted something together and this one goes, that means I'm going to turn off a power because that's going to save me buying new new output transistors, or in this case, trashing the thing. But uh, keep that in mind. Let's have a listen. And it's on. It's not making noise out of either transformer nor the speaker. So, we have a green LED. We trapped the over solace protection circuit in my test area, but we should get some signal out of this now, I hope. Well, that sounds a lot better than it did before.
This thing is rubber loud. Jeez. Oh god. Ah. This is the wrong music for this. That's working. Quite all right, I would say. So, back together it goes. Thank you for watching. Cheerio. Jeez, the crossover in this thing is poor. This, this is a real 14 year old 60 hertz bass bumper right here. So we're feeding it 60 hertz now. Turn it up a bit. Now it's starting to get rather loud in here. Turn it to 50, you can still hear it. 40 is still there. And 30 is just rolled off completely. And if we turn off the volume a bit, we can see the meter. But uh, it's just the amplifier rolling off. If we turn to 40 now, bam, more output, 50, more output. 60 is just through the roof. So this thing's just not tuned for low frequencies at all. It's barely even a subwoofer. What a shame. Oh, and just to have a bear, here's all the parts that came out of it. Bunch of bad caps, the bodge cap on the uh, crossover board, and uh, one of the op amps, which was underneath the cap running very hot. So, really, not all that much wrong in this thing. Save for all the stuff that whoever worked it before did to it. And uh, while this subwoofer does not sound very good in my ears, I do like the fact that it's got a proper internal high-pass filter. There's a couple of big caps in it which uh, filter the uh, output, so you can actually use this thing as a high-pass filter to just take the input from a random amplifier and put it into something like that without having to use any kind of external uh, high-pass filter, which is a very useful feature. And for, you know, shoving a couple of random trash speakers like those up and just having a music system with minimal components, hey, that's not a, that bad of a thing. And uh, we need to consider the limitations of this uh, box because this is not a big subwoofer. It has a rather big 18-inch driver in a cabinet which is very, very small uh, because it's actually got about that much uh, dedicated to the amplifier. There's a board cutting the you know, cabinet in two, so really we're uh, losing almost a quarter of the volume to the amplifier. And that is, of course, to make them uh, enable them to build a cheap amplifier which doesn't have to be airproof uh, because there's no real uh, uh, seals on anything in this. They're just uh, having it as a speaker box and an amplifier box. Why they didn't just have the amplifier and an external chassis is beyond me. That would have been a much more reliable solution. Oh, yeah. One Kef PSW2000. Repaired.